Hello, friends. Welcome to the Making Spaces podcast. I am Sarah Heath, and this is Josie Jimenez. And this is a podcast about how we make space both literally and figuratively for each other and for ourselves in um, art ways, whether it be or we're making community uh, spaces for other people emotionally, spiritually, all those kind of things. So today we have the Stephen Homestead, who is a uh, incredible space maker in a lot of ways in that he's actually a graphic artist. Um, and I have to ask Stephen later, we'll ask and talk about it, but I really want to know, is that what you studied in school? Because I don't think we've ever had this conversation. No, I didn't study visual arts or graphic design in school. What did you study? Music composition. Mm, oh, fun. <laughs> Um, Stephen has run several ministries that are um, around creating art. He also has a, a group that he gathers just to have conversations about art and what that does for society and culture. And we're just really excited to have you here. So we're going to open up with the question we ask everyone. What is one of your favorite spaces and why? I thought a lot about that question. I love so many spaces. Um, I think the kitchen table is one. I thought I could go really big and talk about like an architectural space, but I love kitchen tables because they're not just for gathering for eating, they're also for like work, homework. Um, they, they, they sit in this kind of, I don't know, liminal space sometimes between like a family room or a living room or a kitchen or they're kind of like very multifunctional. I love yeah. that. You can tell a lot about people by their kitchen table. Mm -hmm. For I instance, agree. I don't have one. Oh. Well, you kind of do. Your patio table is kitchen-esque. Which I think tells you about me. So I have a kitchen table on my patio, um, which has been great during COVID, but it means my friends and I most often eat outside on my patio. But where normally a dining room table would be, is where my uh, podcast studio and office space is. Cool. That makes sense. Yeah. It's kind of <laughs> like right now we're gathering at your table. True. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Joe's, what were you going to say about that? I feel like I cut you off. I'm so sorry. About kitchen tables? Mm-hmm. Um, I do all of my creative work at my kitchen table, and I've only ever worked at kitchen tables. I don't, even in college, I was always working in the, my dining room table. I could never stand working at a desk. It's not my jam. Yeah, I hear yeah. you. In college, I would always go into like the, the community space mm -hmm. uh, of where I lived at a table. I, I didn't like hunkering down in my room. I'd rather be out where there were people um, to just kind of give that kind of energy. Yeah. I think and that's they're kind always of a, like bigger too. More yeah, they're bigger. They have more um, like different options, right? Like you don't have to just like desks. You only have so much space. My desk that I work on is pretty big um, because I need to have multiple screens and then I have different projects going on. I like to keep my workspace very tidy, but other people like to just like lay everything out. So um, I think that's fascinating. I think all of us are, I liked to work in college, I most I like to go to coffee shops. I put in earphones, work at a giant table, wouldn't talk to anybody, but I just like to be around other people. It was like the mm -hmm. space that um, I could kind of dwell with people, but not necessarily being distracted by them, but just being around them, I think. Interesting. Um, Steven, tell us about your work. Tell us kind of what, um, I love what you're doing with gathering um, creatives around this idea of kind of in a way talking about space making, but tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days. Yeah. In 2020, I discovered that I really liked online poetry reading. I had, I had previously been a curator for Boca de Oro, which is uh, the OC's uh, literary festival. And moving things online allowed the community to, to fluctuate in size, like whether it was a, f a handful of people, or a lot of people, um, it didn't really matter. I wasn't trying to fill a room. Um, and so there was also this way where we could like share the text of the poetry readings and it creates this great discussion space. Um, so that's one, of the, that's one of the things that I really enjoyed personally about 2020 that, um, 
I get to do a lot of creative Zooms. I don't, I'm not um, doing a lot of work-related Zooms. And so I, I think they're fun. Some people get so bored and Zoomed out, but the ones that I'm creating for myself are always around conversation topics or um, art projects that I'm interested in. So that's one of the things that I've, I've done in 2020 that, that is different, but also similar because I love gathering people to, to spaces, um, gallery spaces or interactive art spaces. And so I'm kind of picturing like these online events that I'm hosting as my community art practice right now. It's so funny because I, um, you invited me to come to a conversation around um, making spaces essentially for people. And I was laughing because I had no idea. I was like, I guess I just log on. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know who was going to be involved. And it was incredible and such a great connection with people. But I think people just knowing you know that the space that you're going to create will be interesting. We may not know at first like what it is, but it's always going to give us something that we're surprised about getting, which I think is such a gift. Um, you're definitely a space maker um, for creatives. And it's so funny because you're kind of the center of the universe. We were just talking to Scott Erickson, who knows you. Um, and it's like so many people just know, oh, they call you Scuba Steve. We know Scuba mm -hmm. Steve. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's so fun. Uh, and especially to know like, so if you studied music, um, how did you end up you know, doing more poetry and uh, visual art and that sort of stuff. How did I end up that way? Um, as a kid, I remember hearing about, uh, at least in European history, the concept of the Renaissance man and thinking that was a super cool thing. And it wasn't necessarily a prayer that I had. It was just a thought. And I think God turned that thought into a prayer and answered it. And so as as I finished up my master's in music composition, I was kind of burnt out. I had, I had like thrown everything in the kitchen sink into this, this uh, master's thesis piece. And that's when I discovered that my church community had a space for artists and jumped headlong in. And just kind of through that, meeting with people who are at the, what I call the intersection of arts and faith, it just inspired me to pursue different forms of creativity. That's how I met Scott Erickson um, and got to work on some of his murals that he did at our church space. It's how I met my friend Jose Lozano, who's a poet, who is one of the people that inspired me to write poetry. And so it's kind of been this, um, I don't know, it's kind of been in the, in the, in the um, like the pendulum swing of, of like going really heavy into music and then like doing a, a bunch of visual art and Right now, the type of work that I, I really have been into, which is uh, creating uh, interactive public artwork um, in a time when people can't gather publicly in large groups for my type of work, um, kind of discovering how I can leverage Zoom um, for that event that you, you were a guest on, that making spaces, that, uh, that discussion we had with Marlita and Billy, yeah. It's interesting. A lot of people would say, um, I don't have the training for that. And what I think is so inspiring about you is you're like, I'll figure that out. Like who would go up to a professional artist and be like, I can help you with this mural. <laughs> like, you know, Or, oh, poetry. I'll just pick that up. I think there's, the truth is, is we all have it in us, right? And so making space for um, being an amateur and just doing it. Um, it's really inspiring. Yeah, there's this, there's this way that I think artists and creatives who, who make progress are the ones that are, are willing to make, make the mistakes. They're willing to, I think of it like children, like toddlers learning to walk. Um, in the right, I'll, I'll say in the right space, um, we get the opportunity to like, trip. We get the opportunity to fall. Um, and our quote unquote parents in that space are excited about the progress we're making forward rather than angry at the fact that we stumbled. And so I think um, that's the kind of space you make. That's the kind of space I find that creatives in good generative spaces are making for each other. It's like, I love that you're making 
in the back of my mind, I might not like it a ton, but sometimes I'll just cheer you on to keep making because that's how we make that, that, um, that expansion um, in our creative lives. I so identify with this idea of being a renaissance human um, because I feel like I'm a renaissance human. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> I get really bored with certain things and then I heard an artist or I read an artist talk about how sometimes it's about like taking a breath from what you're doing. You take a breath and then you go breathe into this new thing mm. and then you can come back later. Um, and I just can't keep my breath on one thing for very long <laughs> but I mean I think it's it, it all kind of informs each other which is probably why people don't necessarily try new things is because they don't think that one will lead to the other like there's so many things from my painting class that I sucked at that I use in my photography <laughs> or um, my writing that I use in my jewelry or whatever you know it's all kind of intermingled and I feel like people really don't understand that quite yet hmm. you feel it like sounds it is... like Go ahead. Sorry. it sounds Go like ahead. you're working in metaphor too then because if you're if you're crossing writing over into jewelry and painting and photography it's all it's um working in these these areas of symbolism which I think are, are really rich for for creatives yeah mm -hmm. I it also opens that I feel like um people don't realize that once you start at opening, it expands and expands and expands. So, you know, if you're willing to be wrong in an art form, then you're willing to be wrong. And, and there is no wrong. The secret to all of it is that there is no wrong, um, but there is an opportunity to um, not be amazing at something and then keep not being amazing and keep, you know, just you're willing to make mistakes, I think is how you put it. And I think that's so true. People are so fearful of failing that they don't, try. I know a ton of very talented musicians who are always about to put out their first album, right? Mm -hmm. Because they just are so afraid of getting it wrong instead of like making the space for failure. And oh yeah, maybe that's not my best thing. Um, I think of like Justin Timberlake, people, you know, will be like, oh, his last album was awful. And I'm like, no, it was different. And he was, at least he was trying. I get tired of the same artist who puts out the same Drake, for instance, whatever, like dude puts out the same album again and again and again. And I think when we are willing to try something new or engage something different, it informs our other art form, it informs our other things that we're doing, right? Like you said, like your jewelry is going to be informed by how you paint or, you know, uh, and I think we don't, I don't know, Stephen, as a kid, I'm glad to hear that you heard renaissance as a good thing um i think unfortunately in western culture it's like find the thing and then narrow down on the thing and then get really good at the thing um and those people are also often very very successful right so we have all these instagram accounts about one thing and people are engaging it engaging it, engaging it. it's very hard i think for people like us who have multiple levels of things that we like has that been your experience <laughs> I've, I've gotten advice from some really close friends of mine to narrow things down in the past and mm -hmm. to focus on music or to focus on visual art or to focus on writing. And just within me, I knew what, uh, I knew what I had to pursue. I was like, I hear what you're saying. I get the idea that a laser is really focused and a laser has a lot of power, but that's not my story. I just couldn't focus on one thing. I need to, um, I need to explore the different forms of creativity. And it might not mean that I get as deeply invested or as deeply um, quote unquote far in one art form. Like my, my sketching skills are not nearly up to the level of other people who really spend their lives honing that craft but I could get to a level where it was satisfying enough for me and I could represent something that I needed to say in that moment. And if I need to say it again, then that just means the work is back on me to progress in that way again. Um, in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm, I, I can't help but think of like the Enneagram number seven. It's just mm -hmm. like, no, I want to try all these things. It's not part of my shape to, to focus on that one thing and get really great at it. 
not that I'm not trying to get quote unquote great at different things. Um, it's a just it's it's a different type of exploration. Yeah, and I yeah. mean I think there's this like fallacy to having to be good at only one thing, and that is what's going to be fulfilling and bring you success. I mean, what is success anyway, right? It, Leo, uh, what's this? Leonardo da Vinci was super successful, but he did everything, and Van Gogh did one thing, but he was not successful in his lifetime. So what is there's no like formula of how to be this great creative great artist it's kind of just do something and see what happens yeah that's an interesting that's an interesting word to bring up um success in a lot of yeah. different art forms um i've been thinking about something i told my friend kateri recently in conversation with her i realized that the way that I approach music versus the way I approach visual arts, I'm trying to say something different. I find that in my visual art, it's often meant to bring something that's like external to myself. Um, I might value the concept of it. Um, like my Saints and Icons pieces is asking us to like relook at polarizing public figures with a different lens. But that's not necessarily about me. Whereas my music sometimes is is like me wrestling with my own insecurities or my own pain um, in a different way. And so then the success of that is, did I work that out? Am I pleased with the song that I wrote because it's, it's representing my inner heart versus is this engaging someone else who's viewing it or listening to it? So those, those two different kind of, I noticed those two different, um, I don't want to say directions, um, but where they're sitting for me is different um, sometimes in a project. And that means it, for a poem, um, I find that, that that's an art practice which kind of like that um, intersects both. Sometimes I'm dealing with something I'm wrestling over. Um, a lot of like relational loss in 2020, a lot of like community disconnect that was very heartfelt I put into some of my poetry but sometimes it's just a message that's external someone will read it on one of the the online poetry readings and if it touches that one person that can be a success mm. it's interesting too to talk about external versus internal but um, both are personal mm -hmm. um, I think we sometimes think songs that are about you know, that used to be like, you would hear a song and you'd be like, ooh, who are they? Like, poor Taylor Swift. Everyone wants to know, like, who Taylor Swift, which ex is she talking about, right? Um, but when it comes to an art piece, I think we're much more likely to engage it from the perspective of what is it saying to the general, not what is it about necessarily, but what is it saying? I don't know if that makes sense, but um, it's saying something versus... Uh, emoting something or giving a mm -hmm. um an internal thing i've never thought about that that sometimes artwork is the um reaction to the external it can be or it's you know some of van gogh's stuff was pretty personal mm -hmm. <laughs> picasso's stuff was definitely personal um mm -hmm. it's so what is if you for both of you i guess this is almost a question for both of you because you have so many interests in uh same for me as well what are some practices, like what are daily practices that you engage in to make sure that you're creating? Um, do you have daily practices and rhythms to your creating space for yourself to create? Hmm, good question. <laughs> I think for me, I mean, I'm always doing something creative. I'm always, a lot of it is that I can't stop doing things with my hands, um, but I'm always even if it's a spreadsheet on Excel, it always has to be done creatively. Um, and I, I think it's just a habit. I've, I've always known that being a creative takes like this intentionality. You have to do it over and over and over again. Even if you're not working on a certain project, you just have to work on it. Like with the writing, you may not be working on your book, but you have to keep writing in order to get to the point where you can do the book. Um, yeah, I guess it's just 
a practice that has become just part of my daily routine. You have like a certain time or is it just no. like all day? It just happens. Yeah. She's praying without ceasing. Mm-hmm. Got it. Mm-hmm. I've developed a practice for myself that took me quite a long time to get to just the sheer discipline of it. I'll respond to uh, uh, like a line of scripture every morning on a blank sheet of paper, Um, not lined because I need to be able to write really large or really small, depending on how much I feel like I have to say. Um, But that took me a number of years to get to that point, just where it was like normal for me to wake up. And it's not always something that I can make the space for. Sometimes I'll like set an alarm on my phone to like get to it at night. But if I have my um, kind of like monkish morning where I wake up and it's quiet and I get my coffee and I sit down at the kitchen table and I write, that's one practice um, where it allows me to respond to God. It allows me to respond to myself. Sometimes I'm purely venting. Um, Sometimes I'm ideating. And the other thing um, is running. I love running. And I feel like that's when my mind gets to kind of wander. I don't listen to music. I don't listen to podcasts. Um, If I'm really pushing myself and trying to get like a good time or something, it's different. But if I just go out for like a few mile run, then that's when I I get inspired. My brain just gets to kind of like wander and um, kind of a great daydreaming time. And then the third thing for me isn't necessarily a daily practice, but it is being in community. I'm an Mm -hmm. extrovert and I get energy from being around people. So um, I'll look for events or art gallery openings or concerts to go to. And I'll often get inspired by being in a space with other people or these days being on a Zoom. So I'll hear something and I'll write it down. I was like, ooh, that, that, that sparked something in me. Well, I love that. So when you hear something, you write it down. I think that's key too. Um, I think so many of us have moments of where the muse strikes and we lose it. Um, I uh, had a moment recently where I was writing an email to our church community and I wrote, I was going to write the community at First United and I instead wrote the community of First United. And I realized that was a shift of 2020 is that mm-hmm. I no longer say the community at First United because it's not at the church. It is. In some ways, it's embodied, it's a symbol of, but it's the community of First United, which is like all over the country at this point, and actually the world. We've got several people who call from different countries in now, right? So that's a new thing. But I had to notice that moment and write it down. And then a week later, I was working on a talk I was giving to some folks in Massachusetts, and that line popped in my head. And I've since had several people respond to me, that line has changed my way of thinking about what's happened in our community. So I think there's this, I feel like the muse is often talking to us, but if we don't have a practice to capture it or, or a intentional way of saying, Oh, I'm going to write this down. Or like, um, I dated a guy who was a comedian and shyest human you've ever met guys. Mo- when I told my friends what he did for a job, they were like, what? like great actor looked like kind of the guy who always plays the heartthrob in movies, but he was actually really funny. But he wasn't the one who was going to be making the jokes all the time, but he carried a notebook with him and something would happen and he'd write it down. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, that's funny. And I was like, why don't I? And he was just constantly watching people. And that's what comedian, like the good comedians, like I'm always talking about Trevor Noah or all of those people. They, they are just observers of what's happening around them, but they have the practice of noting it. Mm-hmm. That reminds me of this concept of, of sometimes artists get called prophets, kind mm. of like we're truth tellers or we're kind of like rattling the cage or we're trying to reveal some sort of beauty. But um, I also think of that um, in passage from Matthew, Jesus says, I am sending you prophets, wise men, and scribes. And this idea of, of a scribe being someone who just records and writes down mm. and the importance of like capturing it on paper or dictating it to Siri on your phone in that moment, it's good to capture those ideas um, because that's also a way we can partner with the divine, um, not just speaking something forth, but like capturing it and saving it. I was actually at a lunch with you, Scott and Morgan Harper Nichols and Morgan turned to her phone and and I was like, what are you doing? And she's like, oh, I have this app that I use for note-taking that I just if something strikes me, I 
speak into it. And I thought, oh my gosh. And then it types it out for her. And I, and so most people think of her as a, if you don't know Morgan, she was earlier in the series, but she is a visual artist with words, but you wouldn't think of her as a vocal artist, even though the funny part about her is Steven, she is a musician before she was anything else. So it, it is this like being intentional about capturing what you're seeing and, and then figuring it out. Mm-hmm. I would love to know. So you work, do you work for, you just, I think you volunteer at a fairly large church that a lot of people know. Yeah. Uh, and you do their visual arts stuff, but that isn't your day job. That's not my day job. No. Um, I, I, I am currently on furlough from a market research company where I do data visualization and report writing. They call me a story architect. So I'm someone who's, who like helps construct the story of the data that comes in and the research. And that's not something I would have ever seen myself get into studying music composition, but it's one of those things where like the, the journey was very circuitous. And I, uh, I met a guy at, a. uh, creative connection event where we were listening to someone talk about paper art there was a time of networking and he said I'm looking for a data visualization artist for my company and I was like well I volunteer with visual arts at Saddleback Church and I've been working in in data through like the nonprofit side of things so I sent him my resume and that's that's how it happened I was like never would I have thought to apply for a job like that with my background, but it works. Yeah. It actually totally makes sense to me that you're taking, uh, you're inputting data and you're creating, you know, images for it. Like a, almost the interesting thing is like infographs and things like that, that people mm-hmm. are really eating up right now. It's like, we almost need our facts to become visual. We need to mm-hmm. engage it with more than just numbers, more than just words. Um, we need to see what we're engaging. So of course I, that makes sense to me. Yeah. And um, you were mentioning, um, I volunteer as an arts leader at Saddleback Church and I've, I've often sat in the space of uh, community engaged art. So, so um, like at the Laguna Art Festival or the Santa Ana Art Walk, doing um, art projects that people can participate in whether um, it's walking through doors that artists were painting or um, doing stencils out of sawdust on a mural that one of our graphic designers did. But also um, uh, church to church partnerships or community partnerships, because I really like collaboration and just this idea of like unity coming through work, unity coming Mm. through like working together. Yeah. I love that. When you're coming up with like how to get people to engage in, in a project, um, where does that inspiration come from? Because I, I, I so often want to like have people more engaged in, for instance, like a worship service, which is kind of a bit of a performance art moment. Um, where does that come from? Do you just, is it different resources? Where does all of this inspiration come from? Hmm. One of my phrases, I, when I'm talking to people about like developing creative aspects to like a uh, a community function or in this case like a t- liturgical setting I say find your organic reason and that's something that's like from your community what's growing in your community in that moment mm. and so um, for people in the church world it could be a liturgical calendar like advent or uh, a particular holiday like the blessing of the animals or something like that how can like your community grow an art piece out of that or an interactive moment out of that um, it's also paying attention to how God's speaking through culture. So there was a, a few years ago when um, that movie documentary about Fred Rogers came out, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and the power of that television show. I talked to so many people, including myself. We were like listening to like NPR or like an advertisement and we just started to cry. It's like there was something in hearing his voice and mm. even getting ready to like, oh, the movie's coming out. We're so excited noticing that culture was really longing for that um, that sense of kindness, that sense of compassion, that space making. And so I thought, what's an art piece that I can lead a community in that has to do with that? Um, so that's an example of just kind of like paying attention to culture and what's organically being released. What did you do? Um, 
So my last name is Homestead. And over the past five years, I've realized that there's been a lot of like home energy, house concepts. And so I had this idea of um, getting people to draw a house, not guiding them anyway, just draw a house. And this was at tables. People were gathered at tables and then they would trade that drawing of a house with some neighbor at their table who would then paint it. So it required them to create a connection and then also give up control because the person next to them might do purple polka dots on the house and the person who drew it might not like, you can't have that polka dot house, but it created this connection. It created this release. And then after that, they would come to a table where we would um, saint it by painting gold around it and then putting it on the wall. So it created this neighborhood of redeemed houses. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's a super fun project. I've, I've been able to run it a few times and it's kind of on hold right now, but um, it's really fun. Um, and it's, it's something where it engages with people at all different spectrums of artistic ability, because even if um, they stopped developing as an artist long ago, then they're still probably able to do like a little house shape because a lot of us as kids, there's something about drawing houses as kids with that little tree and little sun up in the corner that's just important for child development. I, uh, I think about this story that I often tell when I'm talking to people who are uh, pastors or people who write talks or whatever. Um, and I tell the story that I heard on a TED talk actually of a little girl who in a Sunday school was drawing in the corner and the teacher says, what are you drawing? And the little girl says, I'm drawing God. And the teacher says, I'm sorry, no one's ever seen God. And she says, give me a minute. I'm not done yet. Right. <laughs> and I think like we, that little girl was not afraid of being wrong. She was not afraid of getting, you know, what, all, the theology of what she was drawing. She was just drawing to her this, she was externalizing something internally that she believed about the divine. And I think what a gift that story is to tell other people, like her version of God is absolutely God. Just like our, there's, there's something in us that's brewing that's different. And I think if someone draws a home, you're going to learn a lot about them. What does a home look like to me mm -hmm. is probably different than, you know, what a home looks like to other people. I was um, thinking about this. I got an Airstream recently. That'll be a big part of our podcast soon, but a 1973 Airstream that is dented like real bad. And, but it's this like tin can of a thing. Right. And I've always wanted an Airstream. It's the weirdest thing I know. I've always wanted it as a creative space. My hope is to have like lots of tables to have you guys in there to create with me. Um, it, it, it wants to be a community project in so many ways. And I took it to bend because through all these crazy things that happened, um, my friend had a yard in Ben that I could put it on. It fits exactly, guys. It couldn't be an inch bigger. It wouldn't fit. <laughs> Crazy. It couldn't be an inch wider or wouldn't fit. Um, so it perfectly fits in her yard. And as we were driving up, I've had a lot of anxiety around this. It's the fear of being wrong, the fear of like, did I throw money away? Did I, this is crazy. I just drove this across the country. It's in Bend, which for me right now is far away from where I live. And I had this one friend who she's so funny, but she can be a little bit critical. Like, because she's so funny, she can make fun of the thing that you're like, oh, you know? And uh, I said to my other friend, I said, if I drive up there and this friend makes fun of this, like, I think I'm going to cry. And when I drove up, she started dancing and she was like, this is so exciting because I'm seeing it with your eyes. And I know that how you design things, this is going to be the coolest place. And she helped the next day on it. And she said, I'm seeing it how you would see it. And I had that moment where I was like, oh, sometimes when we are portraying things, it inspires other people to see things that way as well. Um, I love that idea of passing around a house and saying, okay, I don't take ownership of this piece, but I'm passing it on. I'm surrendering the outcome which is such a hard lesson to learn, I think, right? We're like, this is what it's going to be. It's about, you know, the, we don't often get to engage other people in artwork. So that I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That's We're going to steal that. Josie, write that down. We're stealing that idea. Steal so, if away, steal so if everybody knows you and you'd probably be there, so it'd be <laughs> fine. <laughs> As you're talking, um, I haven't thought about it in this way before, but by um, one of the things I didn't want to do 
is ask people to draw a specific home, to root them in a home that might be broken or have painful memories. And so that gives people the, uh, the, the uh, possibility of drawing like an aspirational home or drawing a home that's rooted in positive memories. And so um, as, I've, as I've run the project, some people have done like these really interesting like mid-century modern, modern spaces um, where we don't have those around Mission Viejo or like Forest or something, but it's like, yeah, that's the home you would love to own if you could own a home. Or um, there's a guy that grew up um, in South Africa, so he did a structure that was based on what he grew up around as a kid. Um, and um, because that for him had this like nostalgic um, hominess to him based on his, his narrative. And so it's, it's interesting to give people that space to take it in any direction that they need to, to create that home or house shape. Mm. I was just thinking the need to versus, you could have said that they want to. Um, but I think that word is actually a great and fitting thing for sometimes for artists. It's like, I, I need to get this out. I totally. need, and people don't realize that about themselves or um, I led an art group at a church once and everyone kept asking me like, am I doing this right? And I would always say yes, because you're doing it, right? Like you can't mm -hmm. get it wrong. And we're so not used to being told we can't get something wrong. We're so used to like, here are the rules, stick in the rules. And if you stick with the rules, you're going to do great. But life actually isn't that way at all, right? Like, you know, you said, now I'm doing this job that doesn't make sense, but it totally makes sense. But had you mapped it out to have that job, Nope. Um, so yeah, I like, I really appreciate that idea. Yeah. Of I needed to do this, not just I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is that need to create that you, that you um, find people present to who are, who are active in creating. And then sometimes people have lost their, um, their sensitivity to hearing that need within themselves. I think everyone needs to generate something um, and, and creativity can be like surfing on a wave or having a coin collection or just something that it's like this creation, this, this passion that you're into. Um, and, uh, yeah, if, if we're attentive to it, I think that's one of the things this year has provided is an opportunity amidst the disruption in the quietness, in the kind of like, um, concerts and, and art gallery openings and shows and things like out in the public sphere has been really dialed down. So there's been a little bit of this like hush. And um, I think that you are someone I've seen kind of like whispering into that hush, like what are, what's whispering in your heart? Like what are some of these things that you've needed to do? Um, and maybe it's not even that I'm talking about creativity as much as I'm just talking about like uh, an expansive generative version of self-care too. Like it could be just taking a nap. That might be your creative practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you guys think you've been more creative during this season? Mm, I've been creative in a really different way, so I don't know how to really answer that. I never made jewelry before COVID. And now you're like throwing out like 10 pieces a day, lady. Yeah. Um, and, but I also don't write at all pretty much. Um, whereas before I would fill up journal after journal after journal. So it's, it's just, it's shifted. I think I'm equally creative, but I feel like during this time I've been given space to expand. Do you think yeah. you're maybe not ready to write what's happening yet? No, I mean, because I, uh, I wrote on the plane to Virginia or whatever. I think it's just, it's not a season in life that need that requires that form of creativity. Um, yeah, there's no newness. Writing is about newness for me. It's about acceptance. And I, yeah, I've accepted COVID. A lot of people have not, obviously. But I've accepted it. And so I'm just doing something different. What about you, Stephen? Do you feel like this is a 
equally creative season? Is it different? Yeah, Josie used the word different and you just repeated it. And I was thinking it's, it's differently creative for me. I was beginning to compose a song. Um, maybe it was going to be for solo violin or piano. I wasn't quite sure where that was going to have lyrics, but it was kind of about this intersection of light and dark. Mm. And then that was back in March. And I feel like the emergency break, like pulling a like <laughs> pull back on that. And it shifted and I, and I started to write poetry, um, which for me has come out of songwriting, but it's different to write words that stand alone without like a melody or music to go with them. And so I feel like I found that expansion, like I'm going to explore this version of creativity, which I haven't before. And I think it's been, it's been fun and enriching. Yeah. You both have used the, like words like informing and enriching. Like one is informing the other one is, I think, if anything, I feel like this conversation has really helped me think through um, kind of the gift of the Renaissance person. Um, I think so often, you know, I feel in my own self, this sense of, I should be better at whatever, whatever I need to spend more time developing that, but I'm so interested in this. And um, sometimes it's okay to be captured by the muse. Um, I think sometimes there is time to be like to finish projects and sometimes artists were famous for starting and not finishing. But I also think there's this beauty in being okay with, um, yeah, how one will inform the other and not necessarily knowing what that's going to look like. And yeah, I'm grateful that both of you are that way. Josie, you were leaning forward like you were going to say something, but you're just leaning forward to smile and it's kind of my favorite. <laughs> well, I was just thinking, I mean, it's a, I don't know if I'd want to live any other way than to be a Renaissance person. It's more fun yeah. in my I mean, opinion. that's, that's a great question to ask people. Like, would you rather be really, really good at something or really, really interested in a bunch of things? You know? I liked how you phrased that. You didn't, you didn't put skill level on your follow-up. Really mm -hmm. good at something or really interested and a bunch of other things. Um, I do think that there is an appropriateness to, um, at least in commute, like in healthy community, to help to help shape the voices of people around you because you believe in them. So if right. you believe in someone's gift, you're going to like you're so talented at poetry. I want to make sure that like you're you're honoring that gift, um, and not not ignoring it and so it's kind of like it's re-speaking the life into someone um sometimes if if you can call them into the good that you see in them um because there is a difference between like being interested in a whole bunch of other things or being scared of the vulnerability of of pushing forward into that one thing so it's kind of like those those musician friends that might need to release an album and maybe they're they're um, getting into like painting watercolors. Great. Expand that direction. Distraction. Yeah. 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 But also making sure that it was like, you know what? I want to speak life back into your music. I heard that song and it was really impactful for me. Are you going to record that? Is there anything I can do to, to help you release that? Yeah. Mm, I love mm -hmm. that. I love that. Well, that gets us kind of really well into our closing question we always ask. This has been a really inspiring, I, I kind of forgot that we weren't just sitting around in my living room talking, <laughs> guys. I was like, yeah, that's great. And then I was like, oh, that's a long silence, but I'm just <laughs> bathing in it. So that's great. Um, the question we like to ask is, how is one tangible way that you feel like people can make space for other people or for themselves? And you can take that any way you want to. Light a candle. Take that right. as symbolically or as practically as you will. Light a candle. Light a candle. That's the guys. first thing that popped into my head. I love that. I like both actually lighting a candle and then I like lighting the candle of others. So I like that. That's great. I just like fire. <laughs> and now you see both of our personalities. I'm over <laughs> here with, with all of my like, oh, here's my autumn candles. And Josie's just like, light it. Fire. Fire. <laughs> um, friends, this has been an absolute joy. Thank you, Stephen, so much for uh, chatting with us. How can people find you and the work that you're doing? 
So I have a um, social media presence on Instagram, and that is Scuba Homie, so it comes out of two nicknames, Scuba Steve and Homestead. My cousins called us the homies, so it's at Scuba Homie on Instagram. And then stevenhomestead.com is my website. I have a place where you can um, follow me. Even follow my MySpace, which I haven't updated in a really long time. It's still there. Yes, <laughs> MySpace. <laughs> Oh, guys, I used to say so much about how I was doing based on the song I would choose on my homepage. The number of times people would call and be like, uh, you all right? You know, just <laughs> based on the song, because we actually used to listen to them. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much again. If we're listening to us, friends, um, you can find us on Making Spaces on Instagram, Making Spaces Podcast, and you can find me, uh, Rev Sarah Heath, I have almost everywhere. You can find Josie at... Josie Takes the World on Instagram. Um, on Instagram, we would love for you to leave us a voicemail um, and just let us know what your favorite space is. Um, we want to uh, kind of point out that everybody has a favorite space, so please leave us a voicemail. You can do so by going to anchor.fm slash making spaces. I got it right this time. So yes, you did. Woo! Um, so uh, we'll see you next week where we'll be saving a space for you Woo! yes thank you friends hold on i'm going to stop recording because i've lost my mouse <laughs> <laughs>